Right, we've got a lot of people in there now, Miriam. So I'll leave it with you. Thank you. You will be admitting people uh, if they join. Everyone, there's everyone's in there now. Okay. So ready to start when you are. Thank you. Welcome to the SuperGen Energy Networks Conference. This is the penultimate session on digital networks, and the last session will be on Monday, and we are hosting Emma Pinchbeck, who's Chief Executive of Energy UK, and Rebecca Williams, who's Head of Policy and Regulation at Renewable UK. Uh, just to mention that this session is being recorded. I will be talking about digital twinning of electricity networks, and we are joined with Xavier Belekens and Dragan Setanovic, who will be focusing more on cybersecurity of energy networks. We will leave the questions towards the end of the session. I am group leader at the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing Institute is the national institute in the UK for data science and AI. One of the objectives of the Institute is to apply data science methods to real world problems, such as what we are doing at the Vehicle Grid Integration Group, where we are applying data science to help decarbonize transport and electricity infrastructure. Part of what we are doing at the Institute, at the Vehicle Grid Integration Group, is a project on digital twinning, so developing a cloud-based platform to modernize energy data access and electricity network planning. We are working with automotive and energy industries. And this work is part of a large-scale trial on electric vehicles and vehicle-to-grid called EFO Future. Now, vehicle-to-grid is a new type of electric vehicle charging technology where we can control the rate, the time, and the direction of charging. Controlling the rate means how much energy we can put in the car. Controlling the time means when and for how long. And controlling the direction is what makes V2G innovative, is we can put energy into the car, but we can also take out some of the energy. And why would we do that? Why would we control the rate, the direction, and the time of charging? The aim is to support a better operation of the electricity, net, electricity networks to try and integrate more renewable energy while taking into account the driver's needs. So we will be receiving a lot of data from new data sources, such as the electric vehicles, such as the electricity networks and the chargers. And our challenge here is to deal with these new data sources. So the last thing is we want to receive Excel files over emails from different partners at different times. So one of our challenges is to automate this process. Second, we want to ensure that we are securely storing, sharing, and analyzing this data and third, we want to make the most of this data. We want to get insights on how we are using um, these chargers, what is the impact on the network, so that we can get insights on the operation of the network that could also help us plan the network. Developing a tool like this that helps us analyze and get insights of the data can enable network companies to upgrade the infrastructure where it is needed the most. 
because any upgrade deemed necessary to maintain the reliability of supply will be ultimately paid by us, the customers, through our energy bill. So we want to try and minimize the costs of upgrades, and we want to ensure that we are targeting the investment in the right places. And such a tool that we are developing can help, help us find these right places. So the tool can be accessed through a secure web browser, uh, including security best practices to st store, analyze, and share the data. Now we are in a beta version, and if we do access that website, we will end up in a window like you can see at the bottom left of the screen. What we can do now is we can ingress data, so we can read data from different data sources, such as electric vehicle chargers, smart meter data, and we can develop a probabilistic distribution of this demand. We can also build the distribution model, so build the model of, the elect of a couple of electricity distribution network on the project. We can run simulation and output voltage and transformer loading profiles. Now, voltage and transformer loading gives us the state of the network. So like if we want to know if someone uh, is doing well, like a person is doing well or not, maybe we take their temperature the same. We want to check those networks, the electricity networks, then we check the voltage and transformer loading as an example. On the cloud-based platform, we are using open source tools such as R and Python for data analysis and OpenDSS for power distribution system simulator. As long as the tool is open source, then we can include it in the cloud-based platform we are developing. This is an example of a network. So this is Nissan Technical Center in Cranfield, where we are installing the first vehicle to grid chargers, and we are building this digital twin of the actual electricity network in Cranfield so that we can simulate it and we can understand what is the impact of these chargers, but also run scenarios. Let's say, for example, Cranfield want to install more photovoltaics than what happens, and a digital twin will help us do this. So what are the drivers and components of this digital twin cloud-based platform we are building? The aim is we want to expand the electricity banner toolbox. We want to create a new tool for them that they can access through a secure web platform to help them run electricity network analysis. And why do they need this? Well, this is a risk averse sector that we think is relying on planning tool, tools that are not necessarily leveraging on the latest advantage in data and, uh, and IT. So we still see deterministic methods and historic demand estimates being used. We still see power flow calculations being done on a weekly basis. We don't want to generalize, but this is still typically the case. But also, we are in a new era of electricity uh, sector with more uncertainty from uh, low carbon technologies. So we do need to create digital twins of our networks to help us make better decisions. And we see right now network companies publishing their distributed future energy scenarios so that they can help deal better with low carbon technologies. But our question is, are these scenarios granular enough? Are they granular enough to help us target investment in the right places to minimize the need for upgrades? We do think we need better tools to get us to, to do bespoke studies on as much area in the network as possible. Other drivers are the new data sources. So what we're doing with this tool is creating pipes to these new data sources coming from smart meters, from new uh, monitoring on the networks, from electric vehicle chargers. And then better querying this data, combining different data sources to get better insights instead of just looking at one data set at a time. 
but also using state-of-the-art system. I wouldn't say even 10 years, even in the last two, three years, four years, we've seen tremendous new advances in cloud-based platforms. Why not use these? Maybe in a risk-averse sector, like the network, uh, the distribution network community, as an example, you'd want to test this tools for years before you put it into operation. And this is what we're saying. We're creating this agile tool as an addition to your toolbox. Keep using your business as usual tools, but use this new agile tool to run new simulations so you can understand better at your network. And finally, we're including work on privacy preserving techniques to summarize, anonymize, and synthesize the data sets. I wanted to give a quick example of a great tool developed by one of the network operators we work with that helps them understand what's going to happen uh, if you include more electric vehicle chargers. And this is not to criticize the tool at all. This is a great advancement compared to what we had a couple of years ago. But still, under this tool, there is a lot of information that's not easily queried. And the power flow is updated weekly. So a power flow would result into the state of the network, like voltage, for example. So why not understand how the network is doing much more frequently than weekly? And that's what we're saying. We need to develop from what we have now to even more agile real-time tools. OK, that was the main part of my presentation where I talked about uh, the cloud-based platform and the digital twinning. I want to quickly talk about another aspect of digital twinning and digital network, which is modernizing data access and the importance of communication protocols. This is part of a, a paper that we recently published that looking into the communication protocols for electric vehicles. And we have different entities that have to work together to be able to, uh, to integrate those electric vehicles into the grid. And these entities need to communicate a lot of data. We need to communicate data on pricing. We need to communicate data on the status of the network. And we need to control some aspects, like the charges, for example. And this data flow becomes extensive. And it highlights the importance of making sure that the communication is secure. We need users to trust and have confidence in the system if they are going to trust the internet, as an example, to charge and discharge their car. So, open co so communication protocols are important so that all these different entities are speaking one language, because right now, we are in a state still where different companies are developing their own language to control chargers. And we, if we continue like this, we would end up in a fragmented infrastructure instead of having one infrastructure that is speaking one language. And we also need to ensure that these communication protocols are secure. Uh, we organized the SuperGen Smart webinar series where we discuss these issues in more detail. We discuss communication protocols, we discuss some of the company's uh, projects, regional and national uh, infrastructure rollout, and just recently, with the collaboration of the uh, International Energy Agency, Task 43 on Vehicle Grid Integration, we're having a series of talks on cybersecurity so we can better understand threats, challenges, and what we need to do about them. Uh, we have a landing page where you can find uh, the slides and also a YouTube playlist for the videos. So moving nicely from the, the cybersecurity, in this digital uh, network session in the SuperGen conference, uh, we have two speakers who will be focusing on some of the cyber threats and some of the work that's being done uh, to help ensure that our energy networks are secure. So the first talk is by Xavier Belekens from the University of Stractile. Uh, uh, Xavier works on threat detection, mitigation, and protection of critical infrastructure. 
and uh, he is the Education Cybersecurity Thematic Leader and Blockchain Group Chair for IEEE UK and Ireland. After Xavier, we'll have Dragan Setonovic from the University of Manchester, who's part of the core research team in Supergen, and he's developing uh, advanced state estimation for dynamic security assessment of energy networks. So with the, without further ado, I'd like to uh, give the screen now to Xavier. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Thank you for the nice introduction. Okay, so can you now see my screen and the presentation? Yes, Abby. Perfect. Um, so I'll start then. Um, so today I'd like to, to take this opportunity to, to give, to give a, a different perspective on energy network and a, and a perspective from someone that does cybersecurity um, but work in an electrical engineering department. And so it allows me to highlight the challenges of, of cyber threat detection and mitigation for, for critical infrastructures in general, but uh, also more specifically to energy network. So despite all the cybersecurity solutions that are out there, we still see a high number of successful cyber attacks against critical infrastructure. And we see stolen credentials, stolen IP, denial of service, and a, and a, a very broad range of attacks. And this costs UK industries 27 billion pounds uh, per annum. So it's quite a, quite a high number. We see security operators, centers, operators that try to interpret and uh, try to interpret alerts and verify the threats they should pursue. So every single time something goes wrong, uh, an operator has to analyze this alert and, and figure out if it's a real threat or it's something that he can ignore. And we've got an increasing attack surface. We, we are providing um, new services to, to customers. Um, uh, on, on a yearly basis uh, or monthly basis. We are integrating OT and IT, and, and this creates like a, a very big attack surface to manage. And, and once hit by a, by a cyber attack, you've got to gather digital forensic data. You've got to, to create this timeline of what has happened uh, and, and how to mitigate it. Well, how to mitigate it first and then create that, uh, that timeline. And more and more we talk about critical infrastructure, the more and more we have discussions about the fact that critical infrastructures in general are interlinked together and affecting one could then lead to a cascading effect. And so there's, a, there's an importance here of, of highlighting cybersecurity. Uh, to, to give like a, a quick background uh, to this, we, we can look at the Ukrainian power plant and we know that cyber security or cyber attacks induce three types of cost. We've got the anticipation uh, cost, we've got the consequence cost, and then we've got the response cost. Um, and basically all of these costs uh, might be, or a cyber attack might be damaging tangible and intangible assets. So not only might we have like physical damage uh, and losses, we might also have like intangible assets uh, costs. So when we have cybersecurity or security operation center operators and, and cybersecurity uh, researchers, they are essentially an anticipation to a cyber attack uh, but as I just said, uh, only 28% of security operation center operators is spent analyzing real attacks. The rest of the time, they are just tri triaging, like filtering data. And so that, that takes a lot of their time. And uh, this, is, this is becoming a more, more often a problem than a solution because um, all of that time spending on figuring out a cyber attack they're not spending uh, analyzing those, those real attacks that are going on. And so you might have attackers that uh, have actually penetrated the network, but uh, that are not represented in the attacks that they're pursuing because of all the noise and uh, they've emptied themselves in that noise. 
Uh, in terms of the Ukrainian power plant, uh, it left 225,000 customers without power. Uh, the revenue loss estimated was 27 million pounds. Um, the, the intention was causing physical damage uh, to, to transmission stations. Uh, and there was about 1.2 million reputational damage. And that investigation is still ongoing. Uh, and, and when we know that uh, a qualified digital forensic assessor for, for one week uh, on site cost about 80,000, you can imagine the cost for a four year investigation. And these attacks against the Ukrainian power plant are not isolated event. We see critical infrastructure suffer from breaches. Um, like we've seen this over the last couple of years, uh, it's becoming systemic. And now it's exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We've got remote working, which makes it even more complicated to manage because you might have people working and, and connecting to an infrastructure or to managing an energy network from home. We've got complex energy delivery systems, right? Uh, we've got like, for example, five layers uh, that, that we've identified where we've got the physical layer, where we've got valves, actuators, sensors, uh, wiring um, and local or remote termination or wireless communication. We've got process control, which is serial, profibus, remote bus. Uh, we've got relay, transducers, PLC, RTUs. We've got a very similar um, technologies in the supervisory control and monitoring and similar protocols there as well with TCP IP um, and we go up and up in, in this stack of technologies up to the cloud where we now have like private and public cloud to manage uh, where we do cloud analytics and cloud hosting and this complex um, technology stack induces vulnerabilities. At each layer, we are bringing more and more vulnerabilities. Each of these protocols might have inherent vulnerabilities. Each of these technologies might have inherent vulnerabilities, making the overall energy network vulnerable to cyber attacks. We have also complex threats, and this is, this is quite important to understand because not all threats are the same. Uh, we've got at the bottom of this pyramid, the, the less complex ones where we've got like the script kiddies, the, the, the youngsters that might actually uh, download a tool out of the internet and launch a cyber attack without understanding the consequences of the cyber attack. Well, it might make damage. Um, often it's a damage that they do not understand. Um, then we go to criminal or discounted, dis disgruntled workers or programmers, and that might be like a programmer or, or a worker that uh, has an understanding of the system. He might have been laid off um, and he decides to take revenge. Uh, he understands how the system is, is uh, working, is still has credentials, and then decides to log on and delete the entire database, for example. And the more we go, the more, attackers have experience and the more risk they are um, they are creating for an infrastructure. For example, if we look at tier five, uh, we can see nation states and nation states might be looking at gaining an economic or technology advantage, advantage uh, over another country or at tier six where um, they might be infiltrating an infrastructure uh, and staying silent for years just in case something happens and taking advantage of, of this. So all of those threats need to be considered when we are considering energy networks, cybersecurity. And this is something that's obviously very difficult because each of the threats bring something different to the table. Uh, the solutions might, different, might be different for each of those complex threats. And we also have like, challenges. Uh, the energy sector has challenges. There's a convergence of, of OT and IT uh, where we've got now like introduction of TCP IP operating systems, web applications, interdependencies. There's a, there's a very broad range of standards uh, that, that we need to apply. There's new legislations that uh, need to be looked at like the NIS directive, the G GDPR, um, We've got like the pace of energy related technology 
uh, that moves forward fairly fast. We've got technology trends like cloud, RFID, network function virtualization, software defined network and, and smart grid, which like are great to integrate, but might open an energy network to more vulnerabilities. We've got third parties as well. Now we've got remote access, we've got embedded components, we've got to look at the supply chain, where the devices might be coming from, um, and if they might be infected ahead of being placed somewhere, like infected within the supply chain. And this, this has happened in the past. Um, and then we've got like an issue with skills and resources, where we've got expert, in energy systems and we've got experts in cybersecurity, but often combining both is extremely difficult. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tedious path because cybersecurity uh, experts have like a, a very different perspective uh, of, of what they should look at and energy experts have their own perspective. What we believe we should try to do as much as possible is of course bringing those together uh, and providing experts that have an overlap, inducing some type of communication. And this is the only way to secure or effectively secure um, energy networks. So what do we do? Well, um, in cybersecurity, like at, at the University of Strathclyde, my group does identification, protection, mitigation, and response. Um, we, we look at, at threats, uh, a broad range of threats. We look at them over a broad range of critical infrastructures uh, in the energy networks and in other networks. And I thought I'd give you an overview of the lessons we've learned um, over, um, over the last couple of years working in this field and trying to bring those two sectors together. What I wanted to, to, to discuss also is like three key questions. What can we do in anticipation of a cyber attack? What should we do during a cyber attack? And what happens if or when a cyber attack is successful? Because those are three questions that uh, are, are key for critical infrastructures. So let's start with uh, what do we do in anticipation of a cyber attack? And there is a growing trend now um, to, to train people. Um, over the last 10, 15 years, we often say that um, humans are the weakest link uh, in the cybersecurity chain. And this is not true anymore. Um, the the cybersecurity community decided that this was not true. Uh, and they did this uh, rightfully. Humans are kind of a muscles. And we, the more we train, the more we learn, and the more we adapt. And we finally realized that training was an essential part. So as part of, a, of the Foresight uh, project, Horizon 2020 project, we are building a cyber range or a war gaming platform where we replicate an infrastructure, um, an energy network, for example, and we launch realistic scenarios. Operators come and they train. They train to detect uh, cyber attacks, they train to increase the cyber situational awareness. Is it a fault or is it a cyber attack? Can they make the difference? We can evaluate the reaction, the time of reaction, but also the cost incurred. Some reaction might cost the company more money. Um, some reactions might be better than others. But most importantly, it improves response. Like the more training uh, operators are doing, the fastest the response will be in case of a cyber attack. So training is an essential part uh, of an anticipation to a cyber attack. Another project that I wanted to talk to you about um, is, here's a picture of a Skoda Octavia, but we've applied this in, in multiple fields, including energy, energy uh, health banking, where we do the evaluation of a system ahead of the system being deployed. Um, we identify vulnerabilities, we create a threat model, and we provide a propagation model. How is that threat going to propagate through like an energy network? What are the cascading effects that could lead from uh, infecting a substation, uh, infecting the laptop of someone that is connect connected remotely uh, somewhere? So we can map and evaluate 
those traits. And we've done this, like, uh, I thought this was, a, this was a good picture to put, while not related to, to energy networks, uh, it's, it's one that, um, that speaks to everybody because everybody's got a car, um, maybe not a Skoda, but uh, we found numerous vulnerabilities within a Skoda Octavia. Um, we communicated with Skoda and Skoda then managed to fix these vulnerabilities. And this is the process that I want to highlight. Evaluating the cybersecurity of a system enables to fix those vulnerabilities before anybody takes advantage of these vulnerabilities. And this anticipation makes it easier over the long term. Let's move to uh, what can we do during a cyber attack? And the, a cyber attack, uh, essentially, you've got, you've got to defend. Um, and one way of doing this is through rule-based intrusion detection systems. And rule-based intrusion detection systems are great. Um, and, and pattern matching algorithms are great because they've got 100% accuracy as long as the rule is there. So if the vulnerability has never been seen or if the threat signature has never been seen, you will not be detecting it. But if it has been seen, you will know that with 100% accuracy, you would be detecting it. Now, a lot of systems uh, have a high throughput. So what have we been doing? We've been looking at telemetry data and threat intelligence and adapting those pattern matching and intrusion detection systems algorithms onto graphical processing units, allowing to parallelize these algorithms and reach 60 gigabits per second throughput so that we could adapt it to energy networks, maritime and naval communication services, health and information technology. So there's still, while this is a technology that um, is, is quite old, there's still advances that we can actually look at to adapt it to critical infrastructures network and specifically for the energy networks or in specific, very specific cases. We also look at uh, anomaly-based intrusion detection systems and uh, anomaly-based intrusion detection systems use machine learning, but often when you're using machine learning, it's difficult to obtain data. Uh, it's difficult to obtain representative data sets because you might have like a, an imbalanced data set with one occurrence of a cyber attack and then it makes it very difficult to train on. Um, so what we've been doing there is actually looking at end-shot learning. Can we train a neural network uh, or a machine learning algorithm with a very small numbers of threats in a rep and, and still have a representative data set. And this is one of the, one of the key achievements uh, that we've had over the last couple of years, especially for, for critical infrastructures. Um, we've, we've adapted this for, for naval architectures. We're looking at adapting this to energy networks, making sure that we can detect threats from a very small numbers of representative data. And then a discussion that I often get uh, when, when discussing with, with critical infrastructure operators um, is what happens if a cyber attack is successful? The real question is what happens when a cyber attack will be successful. Cyber attacks, we will suffer cyber attacks. Everybody might be suffering a cyber attack and it's rather a matter of when and, and not if. Uh, and, and we've seen this trend um, increasing so that's a, that's a key question. Now, another quick question is, do you know if you've suffered of a cyber attack? In critical infrastructures and energy networks, we've heard rumors that some of them uh, had been explored uh, by nation states. We also know that nation states have capabilities to understand uh, the networks, understand the complexity of energy networks. And so the question here is like, what do you do when you have been breached? But also, do you know if you've been breached? And one of the solutions that we've adapted specifically for, for this case is deploying deception. Deception decoys across the network. And deception are tailored um, tailored machines uh, that you can deploy across your critical infrastructure network, across the different layers that 
act like uh, one of the components of those networks, but present a vulnerability that might be more attractive to the hacker. It does two things. First of all, if your network has been infiltrated, it will detect an attacker because the attacker might be looking at a specific vulnerability and he might target the decoy. And once he targets the decoy, an attack is being raised. So you will detect your attacker very early. But most importantly, deception ensures business continuity because while the attacker is focusing on the decoys from which you receive data, the attacker is not focusing on your key components across your network. So this is, this is a, a very powerful concept that has been used across centuries and that we are now adapting to energy networks. So all of this research, while um, applicable in, in industrial IoT, energy, naval, avionics, vehicular, and agritech, uh, we tailor it with experts in the field to make sure that we've got those two circles joining because quite often we see um, cybersecurity experts developing a solution that will not be running in the field. Sometimes we see energy experts having a problem that is very complicated for us to solve because we don't have that understanding. And essentially our research is about bringing those together and making sure that we develop actionable solutions. Over the years, we've also found that we have challenges and some of the challenges, I wanted to detail uh, some of those challenges with you. Um, we need more skills and resources. We need to have like both sides understanding architectures. Um, we have often no access to OT or IT systems. Often we've got test beds uh, and they might not be fully representative. So this is a difficulty that as cybersecurity experts, we might face for developing such solution, uh, a solution that is applicable. While everything is there, while all, while all the components is there, it's always better to have like a real test bed. Data availability is one of the biggest problems, especially when we look at, at machine learning, where we've got emulation and simulation, and this creates often a lack of data set. So this is one of the one of the issues, the big issues that we are facing when developing such tools. Uh, and then we have like the broad range of standards, and quite often uh, we need to have like someone to let us know what the constraints of a system are, right? We need to, to discuss these constraints in order to develop a solution that fits within a network. So in summary, um, I think we are bridging that gap. I think we are, we are, every day we come closer to bridge that gap, but we need to have an understanding of the UK threat landscape on both sides. Uh, both sides need to have the same understanding of the threat landscape to make sure that we develop the appropriate solutions. We need to establish together cyber response frameworks so that we know what happens when a cyber attack is gonna hit. We need to understand the effects or the cascading effects of these cyber attacks. And this is gonna be quite important in the future, I believe. Um, we've got to understand and identify human availabilities, resources, and competencies, because they will be the front line of battling a cyber attack. Training becomes therefore extremely important. We've got to understand the pain points on both sides to make sure that, again, communication flows between energy experts and cybersecurity experts. And we've got to share information. This has to be done through the sharing of information. And this will essentially foster this, this great collaboration that, that we've got. Thank you. Mariam, shall I stop sharing my screen? Yes, please. And Good try on now. Okay, Miriam, may I share my, uh, my screen now? Yes, please. Okay, so can you see my slides? 
Yeah, yes, it's there in the. You'd need to put them in full mode view. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Dragan Chetanovic, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Manchester uh, <clears throat> as a part of a research team uh, of the Supergen Energy Networks Hub. Uh, my focus will be on the advanced state estimation for dynamic security assessment of integrated multi-energy networks. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, we have established a good cooperation uh, with the university, Delft University of Technology, Netherlands. Uh, we have achieved some success in built up the real-time state estimator for electricity distribution networks. And I found uh, the session on digital networks as appropriate to share our results. And I will also make a brief overview of uh, possible cyber threats on state estimator. So future electricity distribution networks exposed uh, to the increased penetration of plug-in electrical vehicles, uh, power co electronics connected, uh, then dispatchable load integration, as well as growing demand for renewable energy will have to be supported definitely with more advanced uh, state estimation tools. Uh, the requirements are being more increased uh, considering integration over different energy sectors. But uh, at the moment, I will uh, stick to the electricity sector, uh, which is only the initial stage of our work, but uh, we will spread, spread it over other energy sectors in the later stage of our research. Uh, our aim is to develop the real-time state estimation tool uh, based on phasor measurement units. So PMUs uh, will be enablers uh, of uh, better situational awareness in electricity network. Uh, the platform will be uh, later used to classify and to uh, detect various disturbances in the grid. And we are also planning to publish a few scientific papers on this topic. So uh, the first stage of uh, our development strategy uh, considers developing state estimation tool for practical distribution networks, uh, which means that estimator uh, needs to be uh, three phase because the network is unbalanced. Uh, also, uh, the state estimation tool should be able to process the phase angle measurements as well, not only the uh, measurements of voltage and current magnitudes in order to maximize the benefits from PMUs. Then uh, second stage considers testing uh, the basic functions such as state estimation, uh, bad data detection, and those basic functions uh, should be tested in laboratory environment using real-time digital simulator, RTDS. In next stage, um, advanced algorithms for disturbance detection will be developed as well as algorithms defense algorithms from possible cyber threats. And finally, in the final step, uh, we'll try to implement the whole platform to the real 50 kV distribution network in Duris and Netherlands. So far, uh, we have accomplished the first stage and currently we are here. So second stage testing. RTDS, uh, is used to simulate the distribution network and PMUs. PMUs provide us uh, with voltage and current phasor measurements with high sampling rates of 60 Hertz per second. And uh, further, those measurements are used as inputs to state estimation tool, which is developed in MATLAB. Uh, on the output side, uh, we get the state variables, which are voltage magnitudes and uh, angles at each bus in the network. 
so uh, we uh, are able to uh, get to have insight into the state of the whole network, not only to the state of the monitored buses. Uh, based on the state estimates, we can also uh, detect uh, bed data measurements, which mean the new measurements that uh, are corrupted with bed data. Uh, here you can also see how we split our activities. So to Delft, we're in charge with RTDS simulations, while here in Manchester, we was developing um, state estimation tool in MATLAB. Uh, this is the setup for communication platform. So two softwares, RSCAD and MATLAB, uh, we're running on uh, different computers. Uh, as you can see, RSCAD run on the first one and on the right hand side, there is a test system which is simulated in RSCAD. Uh, there are eight uh, PMU measurements on RTDS. Those PMUs are, uh, are run in REC3 of the RTDS and the uh, communication actually happens, starts here. So from the REC3 RTDS server, it goes to the open phaser data concentrator, which runs on a different computer. Uh, open PDC concentrates the data packages to a single bundle. And uh, once the bundle is form, formed, that is being sent to, to MATLAB. And in the MATLAB, we have a code to separate signals. So we have measured signals of voltage magnitudes and angles, as well as current magnitudes and angles. Uh, from there, measurements are being imported into the state estimation code state estimation code runs and the results are visualized. So that is the overall platform. Uh, this is operational flow chart of the real time state estimation. Uh, we had a small problem with the line visualization. Uh, in, in fact, the elapsed time of the state estimation for one snapshot of measurements was around 10 to 15 milliseconds, uh, while elapsed time of visualization process was up to four times longer, but uh, researcher from Tudel found a way to sort it out. You can see uh, the topology of simulated distribution network with installed PMUs. It is IEEE 13 bus distribution test system. So um, PMUs cover this part of the network whilst these nodes, these nodes are not monitored. Uh, for now, state estimation tool uh, is able to process only uh, voltage phasor measurements. Uh, so current phasor measurements are not used in uh, estimation process yet, but they are um, available. They are available to use. Uh, we tested our platform in different conditions. So in steady state, then under sudden change in a load connected to the bus 671. And we also simulated the fault on line connecting nodes 632 and 671. Uh, in order to make results more presentable, we have prepared two short videos. Uh, the first one uh, will display the voltage phasers for monitored bus, so which means for bus with, with PMUs installed, it's a bus 671. Uh, and firstly, the loaded node 671 is cut off. So when I start the video, you will notice the visible change in phasers. So now I will start the video. It goes right now. So here you can see the changes and after sudden change, the system returns back to steady state. You can notice the small fluctuations until the sudden load change happens again. So estimated and measured phasers overlaps and measured are barely visible, but uh, this will be more noticeable when fault occurs. Uh, however, uh, fault duration is short, maybe two to three cycles, but you will see uh, how the voltage blinks it will be good enough when fault happens. And there it goes. I, I hope uh, you captured this. 
but if you're not, you will have the opportunity once again. So there it goes. So um, you can see that uh, screen was adjusted based on the voltage values. Uh, the voltage only blinks for, for, for a moment because the uh, fault duration is very short. All right, so I will move to the next one. Uh, the second video displays the voltage magnitudes in time. I will start right now. And in fact, those are the measured and estimated voltage of phase A at monitor bus 671. But this time uh, you can also see uh, the estimated voltage of phase B at bus 646, which is not covered with PMU. Uh, and that is the yellow signal, yellow signal. This bus is not visible on the screen at the moment. Uh, that is the bus connected to this one, 645, so it will be over here. Uh, here we use the same test scenarios to verify our platform. Currently, uh, video is showing what is happening under sudden, uh, sudden load changes. So. I will leave you for a while to enjoy this video. So sudden load change simulated one more time and system returns back to the new operation point. Okay. The existing bad data detectors implemented to the control centers uh, are useful for a random sensor or communication channel errors, but they are not adapted uh, for sophisticated cyber attacks. And, uh, and cyber attacks uh, targeting state estimation can be, uh, can be classified into different types. And uh, those types are listed here. And the last one is also known as false data injection attacks. And I will be uh, focused on this one all shortly, of course. Uh, so, this attack can result in intentionally modified measurements communicated to the control center, uh, where the attack could, uh, of course, in uh, certain conditions, escape uh, bad data detectors integrated into the existing uh, state estimation models of distribution management system. Uh, the, this type of attack is usually performed uh, in the communication between uh, remote terminal units and control centers, or in our case, between the PMUs and the control center. So attacker could create a contamination in the measurements by adding the attack vector. In particular, uh, if uh, attacker has the knowledge of the network topology, which means if he knows the Jacobian matrix, he can easily create the attack vector. And in this case, the attacker is able to change the state estimate to new one, where he controls the state vector bias C. As you can see, uh, there is no difference in uh, residuals. So the residuals obtained under malicious measurements and under original measurement set are the same, which means that the attack is stealthy uh, to the classical bad data detectors based on analyzing the residuals. So uh, the intrusion would mislead uh, the operator at the control center because uh, the, he obtains uh, a modified result uh, which uh, uh, does not reflect the actual state in the grid. Uh, considering metering infrastructure of actual today's distribution networks uh, with small redundancy, this type of attack is hardly feasible. So there is a small risk. Some relevant work uh, can be found in these references. Uh, regarding the future networks, uh, monitoring the grid with PMUs uh, that are capable in delivering large amounts of uh, real-time data creates cyber vulnerabilities. Indeed, the PMUs are vulnerable, vulnerable to both, to uh, random bad data and the cyber attacks. For instance, intruders 
could um, create attack uh, by spoofing the GPS clocks of pingers. Therefore, the practical and the, the novel algo algorithms could be exploited to uh, notify the operator at the control center when the abnormal measurements are detected. So I will stop here. Uh, I'm interested uh, to hear your reactions. Uh, if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Many thank you, Dragan, and many thank you, uh, Davier. We now open the floor for questions. So I encourage people to leave questions in the chat box. They can even uh, uh, speak the questions themselves if they can indicate so. Meanwhile, um, I'd like to ask both of you, is, uh, how serious cybersecurity is being taken by the energy industry? Do we need to have more severe and more frequent cyber attacks for cybersecurity to be taken seriously? Or the energy industry is already following best practices and that's why we're not hearing of serious and more frequent cyber attacks. Well, I think that uh, the energy industry is taking the, the threat seriously, right? Um, what often happens in critical infrastructures is not the fact that the threat is not taken seriously, it's the threat that you cannot see, which is, a, which is mainly the, the problem. And so, we need to wait for specific events like like the COVID-19 pandemic to see what uh, what happens um, and to see how we are reacting to those events, right? So you might take all the precautions necessary and still have a very destructive cyber attack, right? Because you might have missed something. So it's about my 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 main point here is about bridging this gap between the field of cybersecurity and the field of energy to ensure that uh, we will have the best reaction in the worst of cases, right? Uh, because at the moment we, we do, uh, I think every sector has now come to realize that they will suffer a cyber attack at some point. Uh, they just don't know what that cyber attack is going to be. And so the more we are to understand uh, an architecture, the more we are to understand cybersecurity, the more chances we have to um, be resilient in the, in the face of, of, of adversity. Can you give examples of some of the best practices being already followed? Yes, so, so this, this, this it's come to my to my attention that um, some operators already run uh, penetration testing for example on on some of their their infrastructure and these these examples show that uh, like a while back for example or in, in some other countries like well not going to discuss other countries <laughs> in some other countries uh, this this is still not the case right so i think the uk is in advance in that sense of like embracing new technology and embracing uh new cyber security opportunities um but we need to make sure that this continues and 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 this goes um and this uh partnership um, evolves as well with the new type of threats that we see because hackers uh, create new threats uh, every day. Uh, there's, there's thousands of, of new viruses and, and malware being discovered on a, on a daily basis. And so it's, it's about um, not only following the best practices, but make sure that we, get, we continue this resilience uh, over, over a long period of time or, or over the course of the next couple of years. Thank you. Dragan, would you like to add anything? Well, I can uh, say that I completely agree with Xavier. Uh, there uh, is a gap, a huge gap uh, between uh, the engineers uh, with their ground in the energy sectors and the um, cyber security experts. Uh, I'm starting from myself at the first point. So for me, uh, the understanding of cyber security, uh, it's not an easy issue, of 
course. Uh, and uh, I started from the FDI attacks because they are, how to say, they have the, mo the most uh, uh, of connecting points with the uh, state, es state estimation. Uh, but I'm aware that there are also uh, a large number of different types of cyber attacks that uh, are completely uh, unknown to me, which I'm not familiar with that. And uh, it's definitely that we from energy sectors, we, we have to spread out our knowledge on this area, but also uh, the, the cyber expert, experts, experts from cyber security area um, should uh, increase, should improve their understanding on the phenomena happening uh, in electricity networks, in, uh, in gas networks, in heat networks. And that is the only way how we can, um, uh, how we can uh, eliminate that gap. Thank you. Uh, Vladimir, would, li would you like to add some few words on this? And also maybe you could uh, comment on the RTDS. Yes. Firstly, thank you very much to all uh, presenters. It was really an exciting day with a number of uh, lovely presentations. Uh, I'm also very pleased to see attendees uh, from China, from a continental part of the Europe. So I'd like now to return back to the question about uh, uh, cyber attacks. Uh, and in this context, uh, I'd like to point out that I spent six years in ABB working in uh, Department for Substation Automation. And uh, at that time, uh, for the very first time in my life, I had to work with communication protocols, particularly those used in electrical power industry. It's not TCP IP. This kind of communication protocols are designed in a different way. Communication protocols used in, for example, substation substations, they are exceptionally conservative. And this is, uh, I'll give you just one example, which is easy to be understood. Uh, by designing uh, MicroSCADA, what means? Uh, it's a control system in a control room. You're sitting in a control room, you can do not whatever you want, but you can monitor what's happening in, for example, distribution network. In this context, uh, ABB devices and uh, SCADA can is happy to enable web-based monitoring, but not web-based control. What means I can't press a button from the control room, which is somewhere in the city center, and to open circuit breakers somewhere uh, in a field, 200 kilometers or miles far away. So it does not work over web, but it works over private network and uh, over specific uh, asset, communication asset, which also has redundancy. So you can open circuit breaker or disconnector in a substation. The same is, I believe, also in gas systems, also in heat systems. So the whole system is very conservative in its nature. However, we are bravely moving forward to the world of uh, more and more cyber space and we are in, in experiencing also cyber attacks. Uh, a typical example is uh, Ukrainian blackout, which has been caused by this. So I'd like just to point out that uh, companies per se are introducing very rigorous measures to eliminate the <coughs> likelihood of any cyber attack. Unfortunately, we are now we're living in a smart grid era so we have more and more communication-based, ICT-based applications. That's why we have these two gentlemen taking care about it. And Stratland and Manchester, we are very happy about uh, providing our uh, contribution on this topic. Uh, regarding uh, presentation which Dragan gave, I'd like to point out, this is uh, our collaborative work with the Technical University of Delft and the Professor Marian Popov. I am collaborating with Professor Popov since 2000, now it is practically 20 years of uh, successful collaboration. And uh, I'd like to point out RTDS is a very expensive device 
which is behaving like a proper real network. And in real time, RTDS is generating analog signals outside of its you know, hardware. And then this information is sent to MATLAB and in MATLAB it is processed. And MATLAB, what, you know, computer, is behaving as data acquisition platform for management of data. Management means, uh, for example, eliminating back data, uh, time alignment uh, of uh, synchronized synchrophasers uh, or data storage. And then we move to the world of data analytics, including visualization. So that's what Dragon did is a, a fantastic achievement jointly with Delft is a real time state estimator. You know, in a control room today, National Grid, they have state estimator, uh, which is estimating the state of the system, what means power flow, voltages, synchrophasers every 15 minutes. Of course, faster, maybe 10 minutes, maybe five minutes. But we ach have achieved, I think, was it, Dragon, what was the refreshing rate from uh, state to state? Was it in a second domain? Uh, it was in a millisecond domain, tens of milliseconds. Honestly, I can't believe, but okay, I'll trust you. But uh, I, just, I just wanted to add that uh, there are examples uh, of um, um, real uh, distribution networks that have DMS implemented and they perform the state estimation maybe uh, 10 to 15 seconds, but this is still much, much faster. Good, it is faster. We work together, of course, and uh, uh, we should check these delays and uh, information report, which we got from Delft. Uh, we should scrutinize that. But anyway, we, we are not in a world of minutes. We are in a world of seconds or, you know, so what means that uh, MATLAB is a fantastic uh, a space uh, environment in which we have data acquisition system, real-time state, state estimator and uh, visualization. Sorry for taking too much time, but thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, But the opposite, uh, thank you for your contribution. Uh, Xavier, I saw you nodding. Did you want to add something? No, I think I, think I, I totally agree with, with what uh, Vladimir said. Like, I think it's a, it's a, like, it was a very good representation of, of what networks will look like in the future, uh, where we've got like uh, protocols that are conservative and that we are moving towards uh, more ICT and OT and like and joining them. And, uh, and I totally agree with, with what, whatever was said. Thank you. Uh, I've yes. seen a, a note from Ivana. Ivana, would you like to, uh, to, uh, to say your comment to everyone? I was just trying to say that I mean um, it is. I, I remember even when I was when I was a PhD student, and and I know that at that time some people from 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 Imperial and some other in in, in McGill, they were also looking at the security and vulnerability and attacks, cyber attacks, and so on. So one of the things is uh, sometimes we think that maybe those things are not investigated. However, I think we need to be mindful as well that this is really very kind of a confidential thing, let's call it like that, or at least it has been, it has been done. One of the comments was for the people who are doing that, we don't know what to do with you to let you go or to lock you up. And because I mean, if, if you know something, you, you are a kind of a dangerous person or could be, could get into dangerous position. But just because we don't see things published, it does not necessarily mean that we are that we that things are not, or at least I'm hoping for that. Yeah, that things are not really done in the background. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a very good point. And the second thing I know that Xavier was was mentioning um, that there is a difficulty to to interact. It is always like that when you are trying to bridge the gap between two different disciplines. If you remember any 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 discussions with the mathematicians, that is the same thing. Or the currently things which are related, for example, to to, to, I mean, finances or to policy or anything. So we need to learn each other's language. And I mean, for, for me, I, I think because power system engineers were always on the lookout to how to save the system or how to prevent really catastrophic events, I think that they might have some, at least frame of mind that will allow them to understand what, what, what Xavier was talking about, that there are certain things that we have to, maybe they're not talking the same language and maybe they will need to spend a little bit of time um, understanding, maybe they're using the same, the same um, 
uh, words, but they they have a slightly different meanings, and that can that can just be a problem more than not really understanding what each of us wants to do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, before we conclude, uh, there was a question which I think is to drag on: Is the data set freely available to use? Uh, I don't know uh, which data set, uh, Roberto. Can I, can I help? Uh, the question is data set. So actually, uh, we have a MATLAB code in which uh, we have dynamic, sim actually it's steady state simulation or dynamic simulation. No, no, RTDS. Now I understand. The question is RTDS data set. So, you know, in RTDS, it is like PSCAD. RTDS is using RSCAD. It is the software used in RTDS. It is uh, essentially electromagnetic transient program like EMTP, ATP, or RV. Uh, it's not the RMS type like Dixel and PSSE. So PSCAD type uh, software, and uh, it's just one network. So if anybody would like to get data from this perspective, of course, that's not a problem, not at all. So uh, just uh, please contact uh, Dragon or contact anybody from uh, the Supergen Consortium, and we would be very happy to provide this data. So now I understand it's data from RTDS. That's the input uh, from the network, which goes into MATLAB to process. However, I'd like to point out, you should understand a real network has analog voltages and currents. They are processed in phasor measurement units. So we are using PMUs. And output of PMUs are synchro phasors. So in other words, that's what we receive from RTDS is the same what we would receive from, for example, Dixieland or MATLAB dynamic simulation, but having phasors on the output, voltage phasor and current phasors. Please, uh, I, I got this message. Let us know, contact us. We are very happy to share and we are obliged to share data with all uh, willing to receive data and to contribute to this interesting area. Thank you. Okay, Xavier, Dragan, Vladimir, and the rest of the participants, uh, thank you for this discussion and uh, goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Dragan. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Vladimir. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.